I wanted to welcome you all um, to the first lecture of the 2021 festival. This is our second site award lecture um, and it's led today by Fatime Big Marathi. Um, the second site award is one that is given annually to a participating photographer in our portfolio review. So Fatime participated in the 2019 um, medium review and uh, was selected by a number of different reviewers um, based on the strength of her work and her ability to speak about that work to receive the Second Sight Award. And I wanna acknowledge who those um, individuals were. There were Nicholas Barlow from the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, Chloe Coleman from the Washington Post, Zemi Barr from Blue Sky Gallery in Portland, Oregon, Husha Sanders from Lux Art Institute in Encinitas, California, Rula Sikali from Humble Arts Foundation, and Kristen Taylor from the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. Um, <clears throat> I also wanna to begin today uh, by acknowledging uh, both my location, Fatime's location, and Rachel Phillips, who is assisting us uh, with chat today. We are coming to you um, from San Diego, Los Angeles, and Pacifica, California. Um, and these are all unceded lands of Native Americans uh, who include the Kumeyaay people of the San Diego and Tijuana region, the Tongva people who called, uh, who were the first people to call Los Angeles home, and the Ohlone who were the first people to call Pacifica, California home. So I want to um, acknowledge that many of these Native peoples are still with us today and are vibrant parts of our society. And we're grateful to them for sharing their land with us and allowing us to live here with them. Um, today is a very, very full day. And we have several more events lined up with Catherine Opie, including a studio tour that was made exclusively for Medium. And I have had the distinct privilege to preview. And I can tell you it's amazing um, and jaw dropping. That happens at two o'clock. Um, if you have not received the link for it already, that means you haven't registered for it and you can register for it for the very low price of zero dollars. Or you can contribute money that helps us pay our speaking artists and helps Medium as a nonprofit continue to operate. The choice is yours. But in any case, you will receive uh, a link to that. Um, the keynote lecture itself with Catherine Opie happens at four o'clock today. These are all in Pacific Standard Time, in case I sh uh, need to clarify that. Um, and it's followed by uh, a VIP conversation led by Leah Ullman and uh, Catherine Opie that the audience will be encouraged to participate in. And that's at 5.30 today. Um, I also want to encourage anyone in San Diego or the San Diego region to consider attending one of our outdoor socially distanced screenings of the lecture with Catherine Opie. These are taking place at Art Produce in North Park at four o'clock and the Photographer's Eye Gallery in Escondido at four o'clock, of course. Um, we also have uh, two public exhibitions on view that I would like to encourage you to go see. Um, one is an exhibition of our participating portfolio review photographers that's happening. Um, it's at street level, it's accessible 24 hours a day, um, literally from the sidewalk. That's at Art Produce in North Park. And then the second exhibition is a dedicated exhibition of our Northern Exposure Scholarship recipients um, who are artists living and working in Mexico's border states. That's taking place at the Coffee and Tea Collective uh, on El Cajon Boulevard in North Park. Um, I also wanna give a shout out uh, to anybody who registered for a VIP pass. That means that you will be receiving a medium coffee mug. Um, if you have not already received it in the mail, you'll be receiving a custom roast of Northern Exposure Coffee from the Coffee and Tea Collective. I'm drinking this right now and it's amazing. Um, it's smooth and delicious and I don't know, things that I, I probably can't describe because I'm not truly a coffee snob. Um, real quick, uh, the protocol for the day is we're gonna ask each of you to turn off your video. If you haven't already, it's probably gonna be best to use speaker view um, just so that you see Fatima's work or her um, as a speaker, as opposed to seeing all of the other lovely faces who are here joining us. 
Um, we are recording the, uh, the meeting today for both security and archive purposes. And as I mentioned, Rachel Phillips will be monitoring the chat so that at the end of the lecture, we'll have an opportunity to pepper some questions for Fatima. So with that, I encourage you to help me welcome Fatima Begmaradi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. And hello, everybody, and good morning. First of all, I want to thank Medium Photos and uh, all the reviewers that choose my work and nominate me for this award. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm, I'm honored to be here today to talk about my work. So I'm going to share my screen um, to start my... PowerPoint. Okay. So, about my works. Memories, illusion, and fantasy are the fundamental elements of my work. Making art is a path of, uh, path of exploration for me. My works create an atmosphere it is um, suspended between reality and fiction. The theme of loss and identity are both explicit and implicit in my work. Transition in my life, both physically and emotionally, have been critical in my work, which is about the history carried in objects. At first, I start with found objects at my family home. And now the photographs and archive documents of personal and historical record. In 2013, I decided to put together a collection of original photo, photo prints featuring my family. Over the last 20 years, my family and I, like many other people around the world, had relied on digital platform like Skype to send photos for each other, um, mostly because um, my family and I, we live in four different countries. And because of that, I found myself missing the family photos and family albums as a sensitive and tangible objects. When a photo is not tangible, it bothers me. It seems that uh, something is missing. Um, but it is, it is understandable in this period of time, but it led me to appreciate more the photo prints that remained from my family or might remain from my family. So I start my personal family photo archive, which is finally couldn't expand that much because it was not that much photo. Then I start with scanning my old family negative that I brought from Iran, um, looking for those that had never been printed because of the overexposure, underexposure, or double exposure. In 2014, I start a new body of work. I began to saw on photographs. I used traditional pattern commonly employed in Persian handicraft. I saw these patterns into my poorly exposed family photos. Sewing on the photo, photographs was an attempt to revitalize those forgotten photographs. During my search for my family photos, I found a couple photos that my uncle took while he was a soldier in Iran and Iraq war in 1980s. Also, my interest in history of my country led me to looking for Iranian archive photos, newspaper, magazine, from um, some decades ago. I chose some photos from wartime and also from the Islamic revolution of Iran. Using thread, I overlaid pattern and wanted to express my personal and political opinion about the country and, um, and the era through this work. Although this body of work didn't take me very far, the time spending at old family photos and archive photographs would eventually lead me, led me into my recent project. I 
I've been collecting massive collection of family images that are related to the last several decades. They are not my own family photos. There are snapshots of, from Iran, groups of people, people at home, people with children, school children, events, political meeting, soldiers. I returned to Iran in the summer of 2014, where I was given a box full of negative that belonged to the grandfather of one of my friends. He had taken those photos during the decades before the revolution. It was breathtaking for me to see my city and the lifestyle of that period through these photographs. These two photos that you see here are one of are two of um, those negative that I scan and print them. And additionally, I insert my face to some of that old photos like these two. And um, I start to write some fiction about them. I was trying to reproduce the social experience of different generation. I was making myself live it, but it couldn't go further. As long as I remember, my parents did not have that much desire to take in photos, even not that much attachment to their own family photos. Their lack of interest made photography more mysterious and desirable for me. My parents have only a few of themselves from before the Islamic Revolution of Iran. My obsession with those photos and with the photos we do not have led to this project is hard to kill. I was born after Islamic Revolution during Iran and Iraq War. I, like many other children of the era, grew up living a double life, private versus public. I must be careful about what I said about my family at school. Iran's revolution began with a popular democratic movement and ended with the establishment of an Islamic state. Before the Iran revolution, Iranian revolution, opposition group tended to fall into three major categories, constitutionalist, including National Front, Marxist, and Islamist. All three opposition parties participated in 1979 revolution. But the Islamist majority began to surrender, condemn the other parties. Eventually, they began to arrest, force into exile, and execute members of the opposition. My father had been a member in a National Front Party that disbanded several years after the revolution. As could be expected anywhere, the members of the party occasionally took photos of their meeting as well as social events. Images made as a proof of, proof of social status and rank become documents to be used against them in the space of few years. More than 30 years ago, a few years after the revolution in Iran, my father burned a number of photos that referenced his membership in the specific political party. My father and others burned these photos because of the immediate risk of arrest. The fear of the socio-political upheaval of Iran during the time led to this secrecy. And with the secrecy came the burning of photographs. The act of disappearing photos was highly emotional, even if not rational in the age of mechanical reproduction. The fear and the anxiety that society experienced at that time was acute. It was a time when the economy and the culture changed 
because of the revolution, war, sanctions, the atmosphere totally changed. Like the photographs, the, um, the relative ease of life before the revolution was wrapped into climate of war and high anxiety. These photographs, though have all been burned, they are wrapped into new shape with blackened edge and smoky or golden holes, missing piece of information. In this series, It's Hard to Kill, I talk about the collective memories and also my own loss. My last trip to Iran, it was in May, 2016 to visit my family and collect more material for my project. It's supposed to be a short trip, but it extended to nine months unexpectedly. I decided to take, take it as an advantage to expand my photo archive. It was during that visit that my parents shared with me that they had burned their photos in order to get rid of them. The act was so aggressive and so painful, and it instantly explained their lack of interest regarding photographs over the years. It seems that something inside my parents burned alongside those, those photos 30 years ago. In its place, fear and numbness settled in. To know this about my parents led me to interviewing people from my parents' generation. I listened to many stories, how people did the day with their photos and saw what remains in their home. I was looking for the history that is hide in the Iranian family home. I met several families who destroyed part of their photos, documents, and books after the revolution. I have explored other people's family archives to create the work, to imagine the moment when my father burned the photograph, the photographs. I was fascinated by the fearful ritual meant to protect an individual and what it means to lose photographic evidence of a family history. I'm making work based on the true story that has happened over and over again for different people from different nations, often after social revolution in 20th century. I imagine what if my father changed his mind after he threw a photo in the fire? What if he tried to save a specific photo that it was late? I talked over and over about those moments. The hollow around some of the individuals in photos caused by burning bring into attention a few important questions about memory, history, and their representations. How does self-censorship and even censorship affect our memory and personal history? Is the hollow a sign of loss, loss of history, or a sign of bringing back the aura to the photograph? Does it omit the individual from history or add non-representational characteristic to an individual's presence? In Persian miniature painting, miniaturists would not paint the face of holy person. Instead, they would paint an aura of fire or light around their head. Some of my burned photographs exhibit similar visual forms, at some level certainly hinting at a kind of holiness. Old family photos as objects have always held an important aura, even maybe holiness for me. Who was chosen to burn in these photographs? And on what basis does the removal of the individual protect the person or the safety of others who are in the photos? 
Alison Lansbury stated that prosthetic memories are those not strictly derived from a person's life experience. And although they are not organically based, meaning an um, authentic experience, they are still experienced with the body and become part of one's personal archive of experience. I rebuilt these memories, although they are not directly mine. I heard them. I lived their consequences. I explored the idea of processing memories, accepting, uh, accessing the memories of my father through this burning of old family photographs. In this project, I have collected photographs from other families and reproduced them before treating them with fire. I make them look like, I make them look convincingly original. And I try to establish a relationship between the real world and the prosthetic world. This project includes sculptural photographs. Mm and also a collection of uh, steel jars that contain the ashes of burned photographs. Uh, and the video that, um, that's showing the process of um, burning, um, even if it's uh, recreated as fictional. The jars represent the photographs that did not survive the fire applied to them. The memory of the photographs remain intact through the sealed process. I kept them safe as a part of history, as fully cremated remains. Their form has changed completely, but can the memory persist? My generation and younger probably will not destroy photos as a dangerous documents. It's not even easy to consider photos as document these days. Even it was print, um, even if uh, we printed our photos and not just saved them digitally, I doubt that these days in the most fearful situation, we burn photographs to be safer. In the video, which is the, in this video, which is the same as the one that you see at the beginning, um, the photographs began on fire and gradually emerged out of the fire, intact and held by human hands. When I started to work on the videos, I was in Iran and in my parents' house, the house that they lived in over 40 years. I walked through the house, the backyard, kitchen, bathrooms, balcony, to work on this making pure process. It's not anymore just about my father. It's about a generation. It's about a, it's about a nation. Here is a couple of photos from uh, the installation that I had. In the installation of the work, the viewer walks by, walks by the video to a long wall exhibiting the burned photographs themselves as, as well as sealed jars of ashes. All is presented on red shelves against a red wall. The harsh red background is both regal and violent, recalling the people who lost their lives during this era. These burned photographs are not two-dimensional anymore. By the burning effect, they find sculptural quality and they are unique and non-reproducible. The final, the final piece of the installation is a pile of burned photographs, burned and unburned photographs. And viewers, uh, viewers are invited to see through them, to hold them and engage with them themselves.
the next project that I'm going to talk about, it names subjectivity and objectivity. In my previous solo exhibition in November 2019, I display a 24 inch by 45 feet print. I use photos that I took around 10 years ago in my childhood home as documents and material to create a huge print named subjectivity and objectivity. Aura is a quality integral to, is quality integral to an artwork that cannot be communicated through mechanical reproduction, such as photography. The term was used by Walter Benjamin in his um, essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Photography constantly has been used to re record the special, uh, the special and ordinary moments of our life. Time has an aura. Each second is unique and non-repeatable. On the other hand, the way that our mind recall our past memories is like capturing them as a copy of the reality that doesn't have the aura of reality, like photography. Between 2008 and um, Okay, sorry. Now I've been living in my parents' um, parents' house um, for in my first eighteen years of my life. Then I moved to the other city, but uh, I use any chance to go back to see my parents and the house. Between two thousand eight and two thousand eleven, I had captured several photos of that space and my childhood tr trophies in that house. The house held a unique um, place in my childhood, much as my mother and my father did. Objects and location which carry the weight of their histories have aura to me. Now in the age of digital photography and reproduction, I find my old negatives and photos as an, as an objects which contain history there are objects from my past and, the, and uh, the subject of these photos is so personal for me. Reality is not changeable, but our memories can get unclear, defected through the time. That's how after years, two individuals may have the same memories from an event, an, an event with the different, even conflicted details. It seems our memories look like photographs that passage of time can affect them. As a toddler, I was devoted daydreamer. I took these photos around 10 years ago to attempt to revitalize my old cozy daydreaming atmosphere. After some specific stage in my life, my obsession with my past reduced somehow, reduced somehow. Those moments are so far and untouchable as much as my favorite fiction books that I placed them under my bed in my parents' house in Iran. Here is the other photo from the installation. The next um, couple slides that I'm going to show are from an ongoing project. Um, as an immigrant, I learned that our history and inherited memories travel with us wherever we go. During the time that I spent to collect old family photos in Iran and interviewing um, those families, I learned that during all the social changes and fear on, in the 1980s, people tried to get rid of their photos, sensitive documents, and banned books by mostly three acts. 
the three major acts were burning photos or books or documents, tearing them and burying them. I received an album that most of photos that were in, in that album were ripped because of the prime minister who was executed after the revolution was in those photos. Or it was the other album that some individuals in the photos were ripped partially and folded back. It had, I had more desire to, to see the back of those photos. Half of the information was hidden there. I, remote, I remake those photos by using the archive that I was making in LA and um, have this in my mind, what if um, the people that I uh, collect their photos in LA, what if they stayed in Iran? How does their friends in Iran right now or in the 80s deal with, with their photos? So as I mentioned, um, Right now I'm living in LA and two years ago, uh, it was March two years ago, I moved to LA and um, as um, probably you know, LA has the one of the biggest Persian community out of Iran. And so it was a great chance for me to talk with people, to hear about their experience and uh, to expand my, uh, my family photo archive. So um, based on my, the experience that I, was, that I had uh, collecting photos in Iran and also here, I, I figure out that the back of the photo is as much as important as the front of the photos for me. So right now I'm working on the tearing part. And um, again, I start with a two dim dimensional photo but it lets me to make objects or kind of device to give the viewer this chance to go around them, to look at them from different aspects, to choose what to see. Want to see just the front or the back with the information from the front and back. So this, um, this part of this series has has different parts and elements. It's one way that I'm dealing with um, this kind of making these kind of objects. The photos that I was collecting here, um, they are mostly from people um, in my parents' generation. Um, in the back of photos, many of them had a um, famous um, poem Persian poem, poem. It was interesting for me to see that, that in that period of time, it seems that it was so common to write that poem in the back of the photos. And the people that I met here in LA, um, it was so, the Persian people that I met here, it was so interesting for me actually um, there are, uh, the one that I met regarding this, um, this project are mostly, um, you know, um, right now they are old, they are mostly from previous generations. And um, there, there are many of them are kind of escaped from Iran, you know, um, for political reason, and many of them for kind of um, religion, polit political reason, you know, for example, these photos it belong to a Jewish family, and actually their crime was to be Jewish in Iran after Islamic Revolution. They even couldn't get the passport to come out of Iran. Mm, all of them come out with a you know fake passport or go through the mountain. So when I was working on this project, the tearing part, I hear their stories and have this in my mind. So what if they stayed in Iran? 
and how their family member or friends in Iran might deal with their photos. Again, that's the kind of presentation that I like for this course. It's a, the light has a dimmer it, the, and it will change. So through the um, short period of time, we can have a different experience of looking at these photos. So as I said, that's an ongoing project. So I'm still working on it. And um, there was a photo that I saw in Iran and um, that um, individuals were ripped out of photos, but not completely. Some of them were, were completely ripped out and some others were just partially in the surface. So I was trying to work on it and uh, it was look like a detective work for me and uh, to connecting dots for, you know, who should I um, omit from the photo, who, who and why. And it less all to these projects that I'm working on it and uh, also the bearing part, which will be a um, video. And uh, I have it, I do not have it right now here to present it. So at the end, I can say my personal history influenced what I'm, I've made. I have all the history living in me, unconsciously and genetically, while I might not be aware of it to the fullest. Thank you so much for listening to me. And let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Fatima, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, thank you. That was really amazing. Um, it's really nice to see such a great group of people here um, from so many different parts of the country. Um, I can't see everybody. I know there are people from Mexico also, so other countries as well. Um, but great to see such a nice representation and turnout and really wonderful to learn more about your work um, in depth like this. So I'll start by saying thank you. Um, I want to, uh, to open it up to questions. Um, and I think the best way for us to um, field questions would be uh, just to raise your hand, um, to use the reaction button down at the bottom of the screen um, toward the right uh, and raise your hand and we can scroll through and just allow you to ask your questions directly. Fatima, the first question I see is from Mike Sakasagawa. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, Hi. First, just wanted to say thank you so much. This was a really wonderful presentation. Um, something that I was thinking about as I was watching your talk and listening to what you had to say was um, one thing that really stood out was when you were talking about the sealed jars of those burned photos being like cremated remains. And it strikes me that, you know, funerals are a form of ritual that we have that are ultimately about um, healing and moving on. Mm -hmm. And you also had mentioned how over time your uh, obsession with the past had reduced. And I, I guess, I, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the process of making these images and working through these projects sort of changed your relationship with both the subject matters directly, but also your own sort of personal, um, you know, what, uh, it, I mean, it strikes me that all of this kind of work that's motivated by memory, I, I do similar work myself that, it's often starts with uh, a big emotion and yeah. my, um, and so I'm just kind of curious how your experience with that had changed over time, how your relationship with that sort of initial motivating emotion changed over time as you worked on the project. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. That's an interesting point. And um, yeah, this project was so therapeutic for me. 
And, um, you know, at, at the beginning of my career as an artist, I mostly took photos from objects in my parents' home. So uh, when eight years ago, I moved to the United States. So I lost that kind of um, intimacy with objects that I had history with. So when you immigrate to the other country, mostly the what you can take with yourself, photos. But we do not have that much. So I didn't have that. And uh, so I was thinking a lot about it. And uh, as I mentioned, I start to scanning photos, but you know, whole the process of uh, you know hearing the stories from other people and working on it was definitely kind of therapeutic for me. And um, to to could do the act actually that my father did helped me to uh, you know take um, have less attachment to the past. Um, I hope that be clear enough. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, sorry, it's that mute thing. Uh, Melissa Smith, did you have a question? You. I'm sorry, I was trying to figure out how to raise my hand. I've never done that before on here. Um, so too. I have a question about the poem. You were speaking about, uh, you, I believe you said that it was a specific poem. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on maybe which poem it was or about the poem? It was a Persian poem actually that talks about that uh, our young days will pass and uh, we will get old. But The poem that back of me was surprising. Are you there? Okay, I my Zoom completely uh, lagged. I couldn't hear anything. I'm sorry. Mine did too. Uh, oh, Beth, okay. you could maybe repeat that. <laughs> We'll be more lucky. Sorry. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I think that's actually my internet. <laughs> it's in um, do you see me? Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. It's it once again, it did, it's doing the same thing, I think. It just suddenly, and it gets open again, so things. Um, um, so yeah, the, the poem that was um, in the back of many of that photo that I saw was actually the, the concept was the, um, the young days will pass and um, I will get old, but I want that you, by this photo, you remember me as the way that I look like in this photo, young. And it was in the back of many photos. It was pretty interesting for me. And I figured out in that period of time, many people give their photos at, to each other. Okay, great. I heard you that time. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Fatima, I'm curious uh, how your work is, from your perspective, how it's received differently in Iran versus the United States. <laughs> so uh, when I was in Iran, I, I went to several gallery, gallery to show my work. They didn't accept because it was kind of uh, political work and they, they kind of worried about uh, they shutting, the government shutting down the gallery. So first time my work was shown uh, through a gallery in Iran, but in um, London photo or no, in, in app festival. It was the only time that uh, the, from Iran my work was shown. Uh, the rest of time I was, um, you know, showing my work in. Uh, I have more recognition in U.S. than Iran. Actually, I should say like that. Um, I, I I tried to show some works there, but all of all of them, you know, the self-portrait. Okay, you are a female and you do not wear her job so sorry we cannot show your work but 
and uh, and also these works and after that so i i i didn't have that much recognition in iran actually <laughs> Luis doesn't have a question, but there's just a nice comment in the chat that I'll read to you. It says, some of the burn photos show respect, and you talked about the auras, and others show pain. Uh, thanks for giving us the wide spectrum of emotions with these images. Oh, thank you for listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was curious about, because I'm also a, a collector of, of photographs, and when you said that you came to LA and you were expanding your archive, I was curious if people, a lot of times people will sort of offer me their family photographs in a way like, you can look at it, but then I want it back. And you know, I, it's this precious object and, and you're burning them and you're tearing them. So I was curious and it, it looks like you're working with the original prints. And so I was sort of curious about how, how were you getting these materials and did people, and does it seem sort of crazy to them because there's this history of having to destroy precious photographs yeah. and now these pieces don't need to be altered in that way, but you're choosing to do it. So I was just curious about I, I never can do that, do these to the original photos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so actually I, I asked people for their photos and I scanned them with the highest quality that I could and I reprint them. Even I print them in double-sided paper. I print the front and the back, try to make them convincingly look like the original one. And I work with that one. And um, so I never can do that with the original photo. Yeah. <laughs> that's, in, that's interesting that you're using this sort of tech, this newer sort of generation of technology to make this facsimile. That, that's mm -hmm. a, an interesting layer. And mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I was like, wow, she's really brave. I know. She's working with burning and tearing. I couldn't these. forgive myself by doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you get distracted for a minute and the whole thing just burns and is gone. <laughs> oh my God. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I promise my, my next project will be a, a kind of fun project. I think I need a, a um, project to recovery from all these emotions okay. so it's really a fun project <laughs> so fascinating we have a <laughs> yeah we have a question from Catherine Opie hi uh fantastic hi. presentation really amazing to get to know your work Thank um, you so very much. exciting there was something um that you said that i really am thinking that i would like you to elaborate on a little bit and i can imagine potentially what you would say but it was a very poignant uh comment in your lecture and that is it is not easy to think of photographs as documents could you elaborate on that a little bit more because obviously you're taking these documents rescanning them you know, and then altering them. And so much is about surface, but what is your relationship to just the notion of photographs as documents? So what I meant was in the, these words, in the digital words, I, I was thinking, uh, you know, about the, 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 the kind of, uh, yeah, not kind of, the scandal about the, um, in um, British um, Queen family, that uh, the prince had a photo with a uh, with a girl that was with Jeffrey Epstein, you know, and the, in the court, he totally denied that that's a fake photo. So, but we cannot talk like it's, we can, but it's harder to believe that my my parents' photo from fifteen years ago might be like that you know, to count on them like that. It's mostly about the, um, this era. I meant that. So I hope that explanation being not. Oh, thank you so much. Sure. I appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, we have Fatima's undivided attention and <laughs> kind of fresh off her ideas. It's really been great to hear some of the other things people have picked up on. Um, I, I made several notes during your talk, uh, just of, of things that you said, just like 
Catherine Opie mentioned, you know, phrases that stuck out. Um, time has an aura was one that was really interesting to me as well. Um, but thank you very much. And if anybody else has questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, if not, we've placed Fatime's um, website and uh, Instagram in the chat as well. And you're welcome to download the chat before the meeting ends. We do have another question from Suda House. Suda? Hi there. Hi. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Um, I, I've actually assigned my beginning photo class to picture their home through the lens of memory. So um, <laughs> you, you've really uh, inspired me and given me um, more to respond when we have our critique. Uh, um, I, I just wanted to share with you that uh, it is my understanding that in Alzheimer's research, they are using family photos mm -hmm. to trigger memory. Um, yeah. you know, Long-term memory lasts with folks of dementia and so forth in short term. But mm -hmm. they're using those photos as, and I'm using the word positively, triggers to um, bring, bring them back, you know, to engage oh, sorry. them. Sorry, I, I lost the, the, uh, the sound, the voice. Can you repeat again the last word? <laughs> okay. In Alzheimer's research, it is being discovered that family photos are being used as, and this is positive, triggers to bring not only the person suffering from dementia mm -hmm. back, but also to soothe, I guess, or connect those loved ones who are now not being recognized by their father or mother or a family yeah. member who has, you know, basically yeah. lost their memory. Yeah. So I, I, I just wanted to add that to the discussion of memory, um, that, that photos function in so many wonderful ways, medically, historically, and personally as you're doing. So that, that's what I wanted to add to the conversation today. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you don't have family photos, if they've been lost or destroyed by flood or hurricane or whatever, um, you, you, you know, you know, you're not necessarily lost the memories, but when your mind forgets the memories, then yeah. there's the sense of loss that's very deep for mm -hmm. all those in the family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was so upbeat, wasn't it, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, I just wanted you to direct you to that study. It might might um, encourage you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will definitely search for that. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah, I guess go to Google, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's great meeting you and thank you so very much. Great meeting you too. <laughs> thank you for the comment, Suda. That was really wonderful. A nice, a nice perspective to add to it. Yeah. Well. Oh, you're welcome. This is another, not a question, but just another um, nice comment from chat that I'll read. Um, this is from Ale Aragon. It says, your work reminds me of Ariella Azule's notions of archive, what lays beyond the image and has been guarded and its contradictions. I love your work. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Interesting. I think that was from Alejandra Aragon in Ciudad Juarez. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for the name interpretation, Scott. <laughs> yeah, do my she best. She says yes. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, well, if there are no other comments, and we'll go ahead and wrap this up. I, uh, I do want to encourage people when we're in the Q&A, you're welcome to turn your video on. I'm, you know, you don't have to, obviously, but sometimes it's nice to see each other. Um, I, maybe I didn't make that clear. I'll try to in, in future lectures. Um, the Catherine Opie keynote lecture at four o'clock is, uh, it's a webinar, so we won't see each other because it's going to be a very large group of people. Um, but uh, for most of the other lectures that we have under 100 participants, we've opted to, um, to do it this way. So um, I hope you'll join us for those. We've got uh, the lectures continue on Sunday morning tomorrow with Farrah Karapishian, um, as well as 
on Thursday afternoon at four o'clock Pacific, Friday afternoon with Paul and Pagi Sapuya, and on Saturday morning with Abdul Aziz. And then we have a live in person plus simulcast over YouTube, not Zoom, uh, event at the Lafayette Hotel. That's next week, a week from today. I uh, don't want to confuse things, but just want to sort of put uh, the, the breadth of what more remains uh, out there in front of us. So thank you all for joining us today. It's so great to see so many wonderful warm faces and um, we're looking forward to a lot, a lot more good stuff today. So thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you <laughs> to everyone. <laughs>